Hello, everyone. My name is Tess Killian, and I am so happy to welcome you to the fifth annual Cannabis in Practice webinar series hosted by the Washtenaw County Health Department and Livingston County Health Department in partnership with the Washtenaw County Medical Society and Livingston Physician Organization. This webinar series is aimed at addressing questions our local and regional healthcare providers have about cannabis use and their patients. Our speakers come from a wide range of backgrounds and are experts in their respective fields. Funding for this series comes from the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs Cannabis Regulatory Agency. This webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording and presentation slides will be available on our website, washtenaw.org slash marijuana in the coming weeks. Before we get started, we ask that all questions for our speaker be asked through the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We will have time at the end of the webinar for the speaker to answer questions. Now I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Libby Stout. Dr. Stout is a board certified addiction psychiatrist who has worked in the addiction behavioral health field since 1990. She was the medical director for the CIRCLE program, a 90-day inpatient treatment program funded by the state of Colorado for persons with co-occurring mental illness and substance abuse who have failed other levels of treatment from 1999 to 2020. She was instrumental in helping the CIRCLE program to become tobacco-free in January 2000 and has been a strong advocate for the need to address all addictions at the same time, including tobacco, to improve outcomes. She has been actively incorporating complementary treatments into treatment programs, including the five-point ear acupuncture protocol and brain synchronization therapy to help patients recover from addiction as well as trauma, which often underlies addiction and chronic pain issues. She retired from clinical practice in 2021 and continues to do consultant work for treatment programs, training on ear acupuncture and brain synchronization therapy, and presentations to educate as many people as possible on the unintended consequences of the commercialization of marijuana in Colorado, focusing primarily, primarily on the deleterious effects of high potency THC on the developing brain. She is on the board of the International Academy on the Science and Impacts of Cannabis and believes that people should be following the science regarding policies related to cannabis. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Stout, uh, and I will let you take it away with your presentation. Thank you very much. I'd like to share my screen, if you can allow me to do so. All righty. I'm really happy to be here uh, because I think this is such an important topic. So I share as much as I can. <clears throat> All righty, let's try and advance the screen. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. I have no relationship financially with any of these companies. I am on these two organizations that are nonprofit and I do share my slides. So if you get these slides, you can click on these links and get a, a wealth of information about what I'm speaking about. I'm really focused on high potency THC. I think this is the problem. I think that if we were still had the old time marijuana, we wouldn't be around talking about this. In Colorado, uh, we legalized medical marijuana in 2000 and the potency, highest potency was around 5%. THC. And now uh, we have these potencies that in these concentrates that exceed 90%. Marijuana has been around for centuries, as you know, and always up to the 1980s, the THC potency was always like around two to 3%. Now we have products, um, the average potency in the plant is about 20%. And then we have these concentrates, as I said, that go up to 99.9% .9 pure. And we don't have any research on the high potency products that show they are effective or safe medically, but we have multiple studies from around the world showing that these high potency products have significant problems. 
So there is research supporting the use of cannabis for medical problems. And if you all remember the National Academies of Science publication in, in 2017, that was a publication that got everybody's attention. And most of their research was based on this one study or large systematic review and meta-analysis, the Whiting study. And basically, the studies for smoked cannabis were all done with less than 10% THC. Most of those studies were done with the isolated cannabinoids that are available um, often as prescription. So like there's FDA approved pure THC in the form of dronabinol or marinol, but the maximum recommended dose is 20 milligrams a day. The majority of the studies that uh, the National Academies looked at were done with Sativex or Nabiximol. And these, this is not available in this country, but it's available in most countries uh, elsewhere. It's a pharmaceutical grade drug that has 2.7 milligrams of THC and 2.5 milligrams of CBD. So it's a balanced product. And their max dose in these studies was 130 milligrams a day. In Colorado, we have shatter bags that are, you know, up to 90%. But just say you have a shatter, a gram bag, it's 80% THC. There's 800 milligrams of THC in that bag. And even with smoking decreasing the bioavailability, that's still significantly more than what was in these studies. And in Colorado, an 18 to 20 year old with a medical card can purchase two grams a day. That's 1600 milligrams of THC. Adults can get up to 6,400 milligrams of THC. This is not medicine. And this is a little video that we made um, to better describe that. This is a researcher who researches pain and researches cannabis. And even he says that the maximum, the, the range that's supported for medical use is lower than 10% TH, than THC. If you get into higher things, you start seeing more problems. And he, his group went around the country and looked at all the dispensaries. This is Colorado data. And it's showing that pretty much everything that's available in the dispensaries is greater than 15%. So it's very difficult to find the stuff that is supported um, by research for medical purposes. That causes us to have these things that are aggressively advertised and marketed as medicine. And so people think they're safe. But there's no research behind this. There is no research supporting DAB as a medical product or shatter or vape oil. So people are doing a lot of vaping and they're using 60%, 70% hash oil. And they're saying that this is medical and it's not medical. So we have consequences. Um, we have a lot of increase in pregnant women using marijuana products because they heard that it helps with the nausea related to pregnancy. But they're not thinking about the potential outcomes of their offspring. And so there's a lot of studies showing this. This is just one of the earlier ones showing a prospective study where they looked at women who were using marijuana compared to women that were not using marijuana during their pregnancy. And then the children were IQ tested at age six. The examiners were blinded to whether they had been exposed or not. And when they broke the blind, they found that it, in utero exposure to marijuana had a significant negative effect on school age IQ. Then this is a study out of uh, Canada, just showing that there has been an increase in autism spectrum disorder diagnoses with women using cannabis during pregnancy compared to those not using cannabis. And we have seen in this country a significant increase in autism uh, spectrum diagnoses. This is a very large ongoing study called the ABCD study where it's a prospective study where they're following kids for many, many years, and it's many, many kids. 
This is a cross-sectional analysis at a certain time period, looking at those who had been exposed to prenatal cannabis greater than compared to those who had not. And they found that there was greater psychopathology during middle childhood. Uh, and so they felt that prenatal cannabis may increase the risk for psychopathology. This uh, has been more recently demonstrated where more data is coming out. And this is showing that it's extending into adolescence. And so as these kids progress in their age, they're seeing increasing psychopathology related to their exposure prenatally. And there are many, many diagnoses that are showing up, but the ones that are most significant are conduct disorder and aggressive behavior rule breaking. In spite of this, um, people continue to encourage people to use marijuana during pregnancy. This was a study out of Colorado, uh, where a researcher had a script and she called 400 dispensaries in Colorado saying she was eight weeks pregnant, experiencing morning sickness, were there any things they could recommend? And nearly 70% of the dispensaries recommended cannabis to treat nausea in the first trimester. This is in spite of the fact that Surgeon General and the American Academy of OBGYN and and pediatrics do not recommend marijuana during pregnancy or breastfeeding. What bothered me the most about this study was you can look at quotes from bud tenders. And the one that bothered me the most was this person saying, technically with you being pregnant, I do not think you are supposed to be consuming that. But if I were to suggest something, I would suggest something high in THC. So this is basically bud tenders practicing medicine without a license. And this is a very recent study out of California looking at the increased use of pregnant women using cannabis. There's been a significant increase and it does seem to correlate with the availability. So the closer the dispensaries are, the more likely people are using. And then there was this qualitative study of uh, 53 individuals where they're asking specific questions. And the women felt kind of empowered. You know, they're saying that I can be very free with my doctor, telling him I am using cannabis because it's allowed and it's legal and it's available. Um, and they're not thinking about the impact on the offspring. And this is a study just showing that more and more pregnant women are showing up with cannabis use disorder, meaning they're now addicted to it and they have difficulty quitting. And with those women with cannabis use disorder, there was a higher prevalence of depression, anxiety, and nausea disorders, even though they're using it for nausea. <clears throat> then we get to the adolescents. And we're, there are many studies now showing that the higher potency cannabis products are associated with a greater risk for things like psychotic symptoms, depression, anxiety, and cannabis dependence. This is another one coming out of the UK, just showing that the use of high potency cannabis was associated with a significant increase in the frequency of cannabis use and likelihood of cannabis problems and likelihood of anxiety disorder. Many people use cannabis, they say they use it to help with anxiety, but what we're finding is anxiety is actually worsened by it because that is part of the withdrawal syndrome very similar to tobacco. Many people who smoke tobacco think they're using it for their anxiety when they don't realize that they're really just fighting withdrawal. Why this is so important in the adolescent development is that there is a lot happening, especially during puberty. And, and so the brain, the human brain is not fully developed until mid twenties, like say 25. And so there's a lot happening. And this is a depiction of this so that, you know, during childhood, there's a lot of neurons being developed. And then during puberty, the brain is deciding, well, which ones are we keeping and strengthening by myelinating? And then which ones are we gonna prune because they're causing interference? And this is what we now know related to the endocannabinoid system. 
So there are two receptors in the brain that play a huge role in this pruning. One is the nicotinic cholinergic receptor that is not called nicotinic because we're supposed to smoke tobacco. That's called nicotinic because nicotine works on those receptors. And then there's the cannabinoid CB1 receptors. They're not called cannabinoids because we are supposed to smoke cannabis. They're called that because we have discovered that there is this endocannabinoid system. So we create our own chemicals that work in the brain making these decisions. And so what this is really showing is that the absolute worst drugs a teenager can use during puberty are nicotine and cannabis because it then totally messes up the ability of the brain to do what it's supposed to be doing. One of the problems is that the Delta-9 THC has a stronger binding capacity to our CB1 receptors than our own natural chemical, um, one of which is called anandamide. Anandamide is a Sanskrit word for supreme joy or bliss. So this is our homeostatic system. This is the system that is our mood regulation system. And the way it works is our brain determines when we need it. So we make these chemicals locally in the brain because we have the enzymes to make them. And then they're used immediately. And then the, um, the brain destroys them because we have enzymes to destroy them. THC is this fat soluble substance that sits in that receptor and blocks the ability of our own natural anandamides to work. So this is a very interesting study looking at over 3000 teens um, in Montreal and they're comparing teens who use cannabis uh, to, to teens that are using alcohol and then it's cognitive testing like on working memory and delayed memory recall. Um, and what they found was that cannabis was worse than alcohol actually. And um, the kids that weren't using anything had much better effects on their uh, cognitive ability compared to the kids who were especially using cannabis frequently. Then this is a large prospective study that came out of New Zealand following over a thousand individuals. Uh, they were picked up at age 13 before they were using any substances and they had an IQ test at 13. Then they were followed to age 38 where they had a repeat IQ test. And they found that people that never used marijuana had a pretty stable IQ over that period of time. Whereas those who were using marijuana um, regularly had a decrease of eight points in their IQ. And you may say, well, why is that important? Well, if you're Mensa, it's probably not a big deal. But if you are at the average IQ of 100, so that's the bell curve, the average IQ, and you drop eight points, you're in the significantly impaired range. Now, this uh, research group has continued to follow these people. So they recently published follow-up to age 45. And what's very fascinating is I highlighted it in yellow, is the average IQ drop for the long-term cannabis users was 5.5 points. Uh, Non-cannabis users didn't have a drop. Long-term tobacco users had a drop, but it was only 1.5. Alcohol, which we consider the most problematic, only had a drop of 0.5. And so those who were just recreational users still had a significant drop, and those who quit still had a significant drop. So this is something that really will last with you. Um, there's a definite effect on IQ and cognitive ability. Then we get to the issue of addiction. When you increase the potency of a drug, you increase the addictive potential. We know that well now for multiple drugs, but especially the opiates. Um, a codeine is not nearly as addictive as Oxycontin, and now we have fentanyl, which is extremely potent, which makes it extremely more addicting. And we now know this for cannabis, because back in the olden days, when it was less than 2%, it wasn't really considered addicting. Uh, and now we definitely see that it has significant addictive potential, 
And in spite of this, the industry wants to still say that it's not addicting. The Dutch figured this out. Um, the Dutch who have always been fairly tolerant of cannabis are starting to be less tolerant. <laughs> um, they found that when their average potency uh, in the plant reached 20%, which is what we have now, there was a lag time, but there was this need for increased admissions for treatment of cannabis use disorder. So this group came out and said they thought that anything above 15% should be considered a hard drug like cocaine, and they recommended limiting the potency to 15%. This is United States data, and this, for, this, this is um, survey data. So it's a very, very large national survey that happens regularly. This was back in 2004, 2005. And it was showing basically that nicotine is the most addictive drug we have. That's pretty much what everybody had agreed. Uh, alcohol is the drug that's used most by people, um, but it has less addictive potentials. Most studies say 15 to 20, or here's 23% of people actually develop alcohol dependence. The drugs have less than nicotine. And back here, the cannabis in 2005 was like 5% THC and it was considered less than 10%. And so it was considered not to be a significant problem. However, here we have data from 2012, 2013, where we have increased potency. And now we have 30% addictive. Um, so basically, uh, this is saying that three out of 10 people are going to have a marijuana use disorder. But if you start using it before the age of 18, it's up to four to seven times more likely to develop a marijuana use disorder. This was a study looking at adolescents in California, over 2,000 of them, um, and just seeing that what if what they started with, what caused them to progress to higher levels of cannabis use? And what they found was if they start using with the concentrate, then they're much more likely to progress to continue to be heavy users. Um, and, and so this is where people that are starting with dab or starting with shattered, starting with the vape oil, they're gonna end up having more possibility of having addictive problems. And of course, this is really pushed by the industry because the industry wants to make money. And, and we've known this forever with tobacco. We have significantly decreased the number of people using tobacco in this country. And still, those people that are addicted are spending most of the money. And we're starting to see the same thing with cannabis, which is very sad. Because we do definitely have an addiction because now we see a marked withdrawal syndrome. Um, and this is marked. I mean, I, when I was running an inpatient treatment program in the last five years, um, since opening the doors to recreational marijuana in Colorado, I started seeing increasing problems. So I started seeing people who cannabis was their primary problem. Uh, and they had significant withdrawal once they were in the hospital. And, and so these are, you know, the symptoms are really increased anger, irritability, anxiety, all the things that people think it helps with, like sleep. So, of course, um, people have insomnia, they lose appetite, and they have severe cravings for marijuana. This can last for quite some time because it's fat soluble and it takes a long time for it to leave the body. So I would see people who were still having positive urines in a controlled environment up to four to six weeks. This is showing that people with marijuana or, or cannabis medical cards. So people that are using cannabis medically, and this comes out of your state, <laughs> um, showing that these people all have withdrawal, meaning, you know, a lot of times they say, well, they don't get diagnosed with cannabis use disorder because they're using it medically. But of course, if you think about using a medic something medicine, 
you don't use it occasionally. You usually use it daily and often multiple times a day. So once people are using the high potency products multiple times a day, it's very easy to become addicted quickly. And so this is just showing that pretty much everybody has some kind of withdrawal and 25% of them had severe withdrawal. And the more severe withdrawal was associated with smoking cannabis, the longer history of use, the greater frequency of use and experiencing more cannabis related problems. And of course, younger age predicted greater odds of worsening withdrawal severity and vaping was um, significantly problematic. This is interesting because they gave um, two groups um, the ability to have a medical card. But they said to one group, you have to wait 12 weeks. You can't get it until 12 weeks from now. And the other group could get it immediately. And then they followed them to see if they developed symptoms of cannabis use disorder. And they found that the people that got the cards and could use them immediately, very quickly got up to where they were using at least three to four days a week, if not daily. And they found that they developed cannabis use disorder very quickly. And the people that especially developed it were the ones that were using it for depression or anxiety. And so this is kind of scary that it's so fast that they can develop cannabis use disorder because um, alcohol, for example, it takes years to develop that. You kind of have to really work at your alcohol addiction. So this is a group that has come out with the recommendations of how you diagnose cannabis use disorder in people who are using cannabis for therapeutic purposes. And it, it basically is that people that are using medically are more likely to report cannabis withdrawal symptoms because they are using it um, a regular basis. And then this goes back to adolescence where it's showing that we're having problems even with kids that are just using occasionally. So this is looking at kids that have cannabis use disorder, but then those a lot more that have non, um, they don't have cannabis use disorder. So non-disordered cannabis use, uh, and then compared to kids that don't use at all. And then looking at the, adverse psychological events. So of course, kids with cannabis use disorder had up to 42% risk of a psychological problem, but even non-disordered cannabis use got up to 30%, which is double that what kids were having that didn't use cannabis at all. Uh, and so this is why on the adolescent brain, this is really important. Uh, again, this is back to adults. Um, this is just showing in the VA system how there has been a significant increase in cannabis use disorder uh, and by the different age groups. So um, the highest rate has been with people less than 35 years of age. I think it's really important to recognize that Black patients had consistently higher prevalence of cannabis use disorder than any other racial ethnic group. Um, and and so that's important to recognize. I don't think we totally understand why that is, but I get concerned about the, the push to say, oh, we need social equity with people and uh, black people being able to have dispensaries. I hope that doesn't increase their use of it. Then we run into um, the issue of psychosis. This is one of the landmark studies that came out of the UK showing that um, people with first episode psychosis, and this is all ages, if they were using the stuff that was high potency and there it was considered 15% or higher, there was a three times increased risk for psychosis. If they were using it daily, there was a five times increased risk of psychosis. But if they were using the stuff that was less than 5%, there was no associated risk for psychosis. And I think that's why we haven't seen that until more recently, because that's what we used to have. That was the old time marijuana. This site was replicated and the study was replicated in multiple sites uh, around Europe and one in Brazil, and they found the exact same thing, but they found it for 10% or more. So this gets back to this idea that 
perhaps cannabis has some benefit at less than 10% THC, but greater than 10% THC, you start looking at developing um, significant problems. And they said, you know, out of the Netherlands where they had the highest risk, that if they um, did not have this high potency product, they could have eliminated 50% of these psychotic diagnoses. This is out of Denmark where they do a lot of research with, because they, it's a socialized medicine system where they have everybody on the books. And so they can look at this. And they said, well, if, if increase in cannabis use disorder and schizophrenia is related to high potency, we should be seeing it because we've been seeing increases in potency. And that's exactly what they found. So over the time that the potency has increased, there's been a significant increase in the development of cannabis use disorder and schizophrenia. All drugs of abuse have the potential to cause psychosis. Um, alcohol can do that, methamphetamine, cocaine. So this study was looking at what is the possibility of people later converting into schizophrenia or bipolar disorder after they've had a drug-induced psychosis. And they found that the highest conversion rate, almost 50%, was found for cannabis-induced psychosis. This is worse than methamphetamine. Uh, and so this is another thing out of Denmark where they were just looking at people who show up in the emergency room because of their psychosis. Uh, that means it was concerning to them um, because you know, the industry will say, yes, of course, it causes some altered perceptions of reality, causes paranoia, and we can walk you through that. We can help you learn how to manage that. And so a lot of people do. A lot of people have these experiences and it doesn't really bother them. But these are people showing up in the emergency room because of um, their psychotic symptoms. And they found that it was about one in 200 people <laughs> who used cannabis. And the highest risk was, of course, for use of high potency resin. And uh, in this study, they said that Denmark had some of the highest potency in Europe. Um, and they said it was 23% or higher. I mean, we have a lot higher than that. And then this is a more recent study uh, looking at the effects on increased risk of unipolar depression and increased risk of bipolar disorder. So it's not just psychosis, but it's also increased risk of depression and bipolar disorder. Then we have the correlation with suicide. And I think we're starting to see that there may be definite causation with suicide. There have been many studies now looking at this. This is a very large systematic review and meta-analysis of over 11 studies showing that there was a significant increase in the odds ratios for suicide attempts in cannabis users versus non-cannabis users in adolescents. This is the number one drug that is present in toxicology of teens who die by suicide in Colorado. And this is CDPHE data showing that over time, there has been a significant increase in the number of teens dying by suicide totally correlating with the increased potency and availability of cannabis in Colorado. Uh, we also noticed there was a decrease in toxicology being reported. And so it's now mandated that uh, this has to be reported. Then this is national survey data showing that it, past year marijuana use was a significant risk factor for suicide among adolescents. And they found no gender differences and there was no difference by race or ethnicity. Uh, and so this is across the board, a risk for adolescents. Then uh, this is very recent. This is looking at national poison um, data um, that has come from the National Poison Control Center. And they found that during the kind of the pandemic, there was a significant increase in kids overdosing. And they were overdosing on the things that were most commonly available in the household, which was over-the-counter drugs and then some of the psychiatric antidepressants. And this study was not looking at cannabis, but this was just showing there was a significant increase in overdose attempts in these young people. 
And then this is a corollary study where it was just looking at cannabis exposures reported to the Poison Control Center. And if you look at these two articles together, it makes a very compelling argument about cannabis use contributing to suicide because of the increased availability and the increased potency. This isn't just in adolescents, this is definitely in adults as well. This is a very large study of veterans looking at um, those using can or having cannabis use disorder um, versus those who did not have cannabis use disorder and their suicide ideation and suicide attempts. This is a really good study that controlled for pretty much everything that can contribute to suicide. And so cannabis was definitely standing out. This is not the answer for PTSD. There has yet to be a study demonstrating significant benefit for post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, most of the studies are showing negative benefits. So this first one is just showing that those who were, these are veterans who were in a PTSD treatment program for a month inpatient and then followed for four months afterwards. And they found that the people who never used marijuana had benefit from that treatment. The stoppers, those people who had been using marijuana but quit have the, the most benefit from that treatment. And the starters, those who started using cannabis again after that treatment had the worst um, symptoms of PTSD and violent behavior. The reasons why this is not the answer, it's similar to why none of the addictive drugs are the answer. It does provide temporary relief. It numbs you, so it disconnects you from the traumatic emotions. But then it can cause cognitive impairment and all these potential problems, the addiction potential, vicious cycle. And there's even evidence that marijuana can cause false memories. So this is a highly anticipated study that was supposed to prove that marijuana helped with PTSD. It was actually a pretty well-designed study. They used actually higher potency of THC and then balanced CBD. And they found there was actually no significant difference between any of the smoked cannabis presentations. And this is an interesting study out of Canada where they had an app on a phone where people could self-diagnose PTSD. Then they could put in the symptoms they were having, put in the um, product they were buying, and then what happened after they used the product. And this, they found that yes, indeed, acute cannabis intoxication did provide temporary relief from intrusions, flashbacks, irritability, and anxiety. However, the baseline PTSD symptoms did not change over time, and they detected evidence that people were using higher doses to manage their anxiety. So they were developing tolerance to the drug, having to use more and more. And so this, their recommendation was that well, even though it may help in the short term, it's not a long-term remedy. And then this is showing out of veterans that cannabis use actually is worsening PTSD symptoms. And so people that are using cannabis frequently were twice as likely to screen positive for major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and suicidal ideation. And they were having some problems with cognitive functioning. And then we have the problem with violence. So this is um, increasingly being noticed as a problem. This is an old study. This is back in the olden times when the marijuana was like, what, less than 5%. There was psychiatric patients. So they were followed after they'd been stabilized and discharged from treatment, um, inpatient treatment. And then they were followed to see how they did in terms of violence based on drugs they were using. And they found that cannabis use had a significantly higher increased risk of violence, more so than alcohol or cocaine. Then this is another similar study looking at psychiatric patients who had psychosis um, and then stabilized and then followed. And they found that cannabis use disorder was the strongest risk factor for violent behavior. Um, then this is another one. This is a very large study. Um, this is a, basically the Katie study looking at the effects of antipsychotics on schizophrenia, but they also did look at violence as one of the items they followed. And they found that persistent cannabis use predicted subsequent violence. The violence did not predict 
cannabis use. So basically these people were not self-medicating because they felt violent. Um, and so they felt like this was an important risk factor that people working with people with schizophrenia should definitely look at whether they are using cannabis or not. This is in veterans showing that cannabis use disorder significantly increased anger and violence. So the blue bars are people that um, don't have any lifetime history of cannabis use disorder. Orange bars do have a lifetime history but are not using currently. And these uh, gray bar have current cannabis use disorder. And so they had significant increase in managing uh, anger, aggressive impulses or urges or problems controlling violence in the past 30 days. This is a large meta-analysis of multiple studies in youth looking at, at, at violence and cannabis use. And they found that cannabis use in this population was a significant risk factor for violence. Uh, then we're definitely seeing it in domestic violence situations. This is a study um, looking at that. And, um, and then this is another one. It was interesting. Most of the studies just ask the question, cannabis use or not, and then frequency. Uh, this one actually then included urine drug screens. And I think it's really important to have urine drug screens to document what's going on because in this study, six participants who had positive urine drug screens declined having used in the past 90 days, which means they either were lying or they forgot. Um, but anyway, this study did show that there was greater quantity and frequency of cannabis use was significantly associated with greater physical and intimate partner violence perpetration and victimization. And then this Dr. Miller and his group look at all the these high profile cases that have been in the news. So this is avoiding HIPAA because it's been in the news <laughs> um, and looking at their use of marijuana and the symptoms they were experiencing related to um, their crimes. And so this is definitely showing there is definitely some kind of correlation here between marijuana use and aggression and violence. This is out of uh, Texas looking at child fatality cases. So these are kids that are in an abuse or neglect home and they die in that situation. And what is the number one drug the perpetrators are using? And marijuana is the number one drug. This is also out of Arizona showing um, in their case, they were looking at the kids, what was the drug that was in the children and in the adult. And they found that opiates and marijuana were the most common cause that contributed to death in the children and methamphetamine and marijuana were the most common drugs in the adult. Uh, just to point out, marijuana has not solved our opiate epidemic at all um, in Colorado for certain. We've had a significant increase in opiate overdose deaths and now with fentanyl even higher uh, and this graph is just kind of showing this, that we legalized medical marijuana in 2000. Uh, it really became commercialized in 2009 because that's when the Ogden Memorandum came out that they would not prosecute federally um, if, a state, if people were in a state with a medical marijuana law as long as they were following the law. So in 2009, we had 5,000 people on the registry. By 2011, we had 119,000 people on the registry. So people flocked to get their medical cards. And also in 2010, 11, or when the concentrates hit the market. Prior to that, we did not have the concentrates. So we had lower potency. And then in 2012, we legalized recreational. The doors opened in 2014. And that's when these all these overdose deaths start taking off. Uh, and so there's much research out there now showing that one of the highest contributors to developing opiate use disorder is using marijuana before the age of 18. Uh, it's, the, the industry likes to quote this first study because this was it came out in 2014 where it said that, you know, if the states that had medical marijuana, they had lower opiate overdose mortality rate. And so there was this 25% reduction in deaths. 
And so they came out saying this is proof that expanding cannabis laws would reverse the opiate epidemic. However, the industry fails to report the second study that came out in 2019. That group went and did the exact same study uh, using the same methods, but they expanded the analysis to 2017. So this is when we started having higher potency products and they expanded the number of states that had now legalized medical marijuana. And they found the exact opposite, that the states with medical cannabis laws had a 23% increase in opiate overdose deaths. And then this is important because this is showing that cannabis increases the risk of suicidal ideation in those with opiate use disorder. So these are people with opiate use disorder on some kind of opiate replacement like um, methadone or buprenorphine. And they found that cannabis, regardless of the frequency of use, was associated with a 40% increase in the odds of endorsing suicidal ideation. So I, I think it's important to to pay attention to this because many of these overdose deaths, we don't know if they're accidental or intentional. Um, we don't know if they were actually contemplating suicide and that's why they overdosed. So what can we do about this? I think all we can do is educate, educate. That's what I'm trying to do. We need to increase treatment, definitely. I think there should be PSAs about the risks. We should be advertising that. Um, and people need to be collecting data. We need stricter regulations. I think people need to be doing drug screens um, and you need to get the information about what they're using, the potency, the product, the route, the frequency, when they started using. We were successful in getting a law passed in Colorado to, to put some limits on the concentrates we also got a warning. There's supposed to be this handout that if you purchase concentrates in the dispensary, you're supposed to get this handout that warns you of these things. I fought very hard to get suicide on this, but the industry fought that tooth and nail. And I, that's disturbing to me because I know that I prescribe a lot of psychiatric medication that has a black box warning for suicide. And since we know this is about marijuana, we should have the same thing. But anyway, um, there are no current FDA approved medications for cannabis use disorder. There are companies working on that. And so there are several companies working on different ways of addressing this, kind of trying to get uh, like an MAT like we have for um, opiates. Uh, there is this over-the-counter option that does have some research behind it. Um, it's pretty safe. It has pretty benign side effect profile. Um, you can get it in a health food store. And so I encourage people to consider trying this to help people when they really can't seem to quit. But the things that we really have to do are all these things that are involved in treatment. And so if you're really trying to help somebody who has um, got cannabis use disorder, I think these are all the things that we have to do. Um, and I just point out, this is very interesting. I, I, I really push the idea of exercise. I think all treatment programs should offer exercise. And this is a study just showing that exercise increases our own natural anandamides. So this is our own, you know, our endocannabinoid system. And so this is supporting why exercise would be important. And then um, these are things that I think people need to do because many people are using drugs, especially marijuana, especially since they have post-traumatic stress disorder to deal with their symptoms. They're, to, to deal with anxiety. And I think we have to help people learn how to calm down, deal with anxiety, stress, trauma, sleep without using substances. And so these are all the things that I train on. These are the things that I um, encourage people to look into and work on. So I know I'm, th this is a lot of information. That's why I let people have the, the slides because you can go over it later and kind of figure this out. So I'm happy to take any questions or discussion or anything. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Stout, for that great presentation with a lot of data. Um, I'm sure everyone's going to enjoy getting the slides and digging into all that. Um, 
We're going to open it up to questions now. And just as a reminder, if you have any questions for Dr. Stout, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, and as a reminder, our webinar is being recorded and the slides will be shared uh, in the weeks to come. So you can visit washna.org slash marijuana to gain access to those. All right, so we did have um, one question come in through the Q&A. Um, Chrissy was wondering, why did THC potency increase? And with legalization, is there any hope that potency can be regulated? <laughs> Great question. I, I think the reality is the reason the potency increased was, was to get more people. I mean, the industry needs people. This is why they advertise to adolescents and children. This is why, you know, we have gummies, you know, that, and all these products that look so enticing to children because the earlier you can get them addicted, uh, the more you're gonna have people buying your product. And I think that's the main reason. Now the industry will say that is not the reason at all, but I, I can't think of any other reason because there has been no, as I said, no research supporting it. So there's no reason to increase the potency. This is no different to me than the um, tobacco companies, because you know tobacco came from this continent, so it was a discovered in the New World and was taken back to Europe, <clears throat> and it's been used for hundreds of years, right? Um, and without a serious problem, it didn't become a serious problem until the early 1900s when they actually discovered that there were plants like in Brazil that produced more nicotine. So they start using the plants, you know, and doing the same thing they've done with the cannabis industry is genetically modifying the plants to produce more and more nicotine. Then they started adding products to the tobacco to increase the absorption of nicotine. So, and, and now we have really potent nicotine and we have these vapes with incredible amount of nicotine in them. And so, this, this is just to create people addicted so that you have somebody to buy your bread. I'm sorry to say that, but I really, I would love to hear their rationale of why the potency has increased. And then to your second question, I, I don't know, we have attempted very hard in Colorado to get a potency limit. The industry fights that tooth and nail. Um, you know, Vermont has been successful in getting a potency limit, but it's still a very high potency. I mean, it's, it's not anywhere near what research is supporting. And so I, I don't know. I, I would hope that we would get to the place where we could say, yes, 10% or less, that's fine. But who knows? Thank you for that. Um, there was one question in the chat that came through. Um, they commented that this information was very powerful, um, but they were wondering how can we stop the impact of these dispensaries? Um, I guess, how do we um, combat the messaging that they're putting out that this is a safe product to help with these issues? Yeah, I'm, I, I just, I think, what I've, I've learned is, especially young people, they're very open to learning information. And, and as long as it's not judgmental and you're not you know, telling them you're just bad people, I think they need to understand the neurobiology and how it affects the brain and how it affects brain development. I, and I think that you know, people need to know that the risk of psychosis, the risk of suicide, they, they need to understand that these are all potential things that they're getting into um, and the risk of addiction. And I, I still see the industry saying, this is not addicting. And that, that is crazy making. So I think you have to like have billboards next to their billboards, <laughs> um, you know, that, that say the truth, the science behind it. Uh, and, and, but sadly, what I'm afraid is, it's, it's going to end up in lawsuits. That, I mean, that's the only way the tobacco industry ever changed was lawsuits. And that's the only way that the pharmaceutical industry with the opiates changed was with lawsuits. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think it's going to have to be lawsuits. 
Right. Um, a couple more questions have come in through the Q and A. Um, the first from Amy um, mentions that she works with families and children in prenatal substance exposure. And sometimes the mothers are telling her that their doctor or other medical provider advised cannabis use for severe morning sickness during pregnancy. Do you find that medical providers are also perceiving less harm from cannabis use? Yes, and this is so, so sad. And I think that these are doctors who are not educated. They, and they need to get themselves educated because truly, I mean, the Surgeon General is totally against this. And, and the organizations that support OGB, OBGYN and pediatrics and internal medicine do not support this. I mean, there, I think the Surgeon General has said there is no level of marijuana that is safe during pregnancy. Um, and yeah, so it would be really interesting to hear from the cannabis nurses on this. And I think they're speaking tomorrow. It should be very interesting. All right, uh, the next question, uh, did the studies regarding violence and child abuse in domestic situations rule out other factors such as socioeconomic status? Yes, yes. Um, and, and so that is just something that we need more research on. I think people are not, haven't to date really paid attention to that, but um, I think it's something that we're gonna have to start paying more attention to. Because as far as I know, I don't know that Colorado even collects that data. Mm -hmm. I don't think most states collect that data. Yes, I think a lot of states that are legalizing marijuana are running into the issue of data lag and yeah. trying to catch up with the industry. Um, all right, the next question. Do you have any information that you've found successful in offering individuals about the dangers of marijuana? It's hard to find the information um, with the information the industry is putting out. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of organizations that are trying to, especially helping educate kids, like uh, Johnny's Ambassadors. Um, I totally support people looking into that. that that's run by a woman who lost her son due to cannabis-induced psychosis and a, um, a suicide attempt, well, successful suicide. Uh, and they are developing curriculum to really help educate people. Uh, and I think that's a really good resource. There's a resource called Every Brain Matters. I mean, these are things that are online, you can look up. Um, they, they are doing great job trying to educate people Parents Opposed to Pot <laughs> um, is another organization. So there's lots of groups out there trying to come up with educational material. Great. Um, and to wrap things up, I actually had one question for you that I was curious. Um, in your experience uh, working with patients, um, when someone was addicted to cannabis and finally came to you seeking treatment, um, what did they say was the turning point that led them to seek treatment? All right. Well, sad to say it's been a legal problem and we're losing that. With all this attempt to totally decriminalize, take away any legal consequences, that is gonna be a problem because um, yeah, that, that's why I have advertised, you know, I've advocated for tobacco free treatment because most people, they don't stop an addictive behavior until they have a consequence. And, you know, if you wait for your consequence for tobacco, it's too late. I mean, you've had your lung cancer, your heart attack, your COPD. And that's why I think inpatient treatment, residential treatment has to be tobacco free to help people learn that they can quit because people don't quit while they're actively using. And so this is the other problem I've seen with marijuana is it is so hard to convince people that marijuana is causing their problems. So I see people with extreme depression, suicidal ideation, anxiety, and they're you know vaping 60% hash oil. And I'm trying to tell them, I think it's your marijuana. Oh no, that's my medicine. And so it is so hard to convince them. And then once you finally convince them, they can't quit. And, and, and so that's why I've had to put people inpatient to quit. But inpatient treatment is extremely expensive and most insurance doesn't cover cannabis use disorder. So it's like this catch 22. But 
the program I was running um, was a court ordered program. Basically 80% of the people were there as a condition of probation due to a charge they got from their use of substances. And that is a consequence that gets people's attention. And so then you can put them in an environment where they don't have the drugs and then their brain starts healing and then they can start learning new things. I mean, that's, that, that's, it's hard. It's really hard. Thank you, Dr. Stout. Um, I think we've 